Hello everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Um, hope everyone can see and hear me okay. Uh, we are getting started here with interview preparation um, and guidelines, general guidelines. I'll just give a minute or two for people to join. Um, all right. So uh, the agenda for this talk is I'll start with some introductions about myself. I'll go through what the general uh, hiring process is like, give some general recommendations around preparation, and then question and answers. I've tried to keep this overall as generic as possible uh, to cover all the tracks, so it's not very engineering focused or data focused. Um, and you know, continue to ask me questions, uh, and I'll try to answer them as I go. Otherwise, um, you know, I'll have left some time at the end for Q and A. Um, so I'll start with introductions. My name is Farah, uh, Farah Ali. I am co-founder of Pakistani Women in Computing. Um, I'm also um, CTO and co-founder for FreightWeb, which is a logistics tech startup that is uh, VC funded, uh, which I started last year. Um, my experience has been in engineering. So my background is I have a degree in computer science. Um, uh, my first job out of college was at Microsoft. So I, I was there. Um, in developer tools, I was there in um, search, and then um, I've been working at eBay um, and electronic arts. Um, and um, my fourth transition was starting my own company. Um, so I'm coming at this from a very engineering perspective, but I'm going to try and weave in, um, you know, stuff for data and UX. Generally, the process is the same. Um, some of the focused um, skill-based questions are going to be more track specific. So um, the hiring process, that's the first part. Um, I did the same session for uh, the North American audience as well. And for that, you know, it was for technical interviews, there's a very set format and structure. You pretty much know, um, you know, you're gonna block out a day and you'll have anywhere from four to six interviews and, and kind of what the expectation is. Uh, with, the, with Pakistan um, interviews, I wasn't able to find um, the a standard across companies, but I think there's, you know, generally follows the same guidelines. Um, so, um, you know, the general structure is there'll be some screening process. So once you're given your resume, uh, if you've been filtered out to be, uh, you know, generally your, the, meet the requirements of the role, then there'll be an HR screen. So the first person that you're most likely talking to at the company is someone who is um, in uh, HR or recruiting. Um, that screening process is going to be a little bit about, you know, who are you, what your background is. Um, they will be asking you some questions from your resume just to make sure that the projects that you've been talking about or your background aligns, you know. Um, and then they will, you know, once they've kind of done that, you at that point may also have some questions around, uh, you know, location, where you want to be located. You might get questions about salary, salary expectations. Um, so be prepared for that, the HR screen. Um, the, uh, that if you kind of are filtered through that, you make it through the screen. Usually there's a technical test. That's another filtering process. So they've said, okay, we uh, looked at their, this person's resume. They seem like a good fit. They seem like, you know, they match our requirements. Now let's see, do they make the meet the baseline requirements for technical skills? So you'll, you can either have a take home test. Some companies do an online um, tech test, some might even ask you to come on site. It, it's very dependent, but um, this will be kind of related. So if you're applying for backend engineer, this will be testing your fundamental like object-oriented skills or your core uh, CS skills. Um, <clears throat> if it's a data test, if it's a product test, that's more likely uh, going to be, you know, for data, it might be maybe more around your concepts for um, databases or you're just concepts for data retrieval and things like that. But again, very skill specific. Um, and then if you kind of make it through that, then you usually will have a full day of interviews and uh, on-site interviews will have two components to them. There'll be a behavioral component and a technical component. Um, uh, most likely each interviewer will do a little bit of both. So um, let's say you have a day of you know interviews with like five people. Uh, Usually at the beginning, there'll be 10 to 15 minutes of like breaking the ice. And at that point, they may be asking you questions that kind of fall in that behavioral um, component. And I can speak about uh, what exactly that means. 
Um, and then the technical component is, you know, they, after they've kind of done that, then they may go into sort of a coding question. You might have to write on the whiteboard. And then they may follow that up with uh, maybe a design question. So those are roughly the types of <clears throat> things that they would do. Most likely, if it's an hour, you'd have 10, 15 minutes of behavioral, maybe 30, 40 minutes, you know, uh, depending on the timing, right? So you, you, maybe they'll give you 30 minutes for um, doing the, the problem and then sometime at the end for questions. So uh, make sure that uh, maximize slides. Yes, um, someone's uh, just done that for me. Um, so general preparation. Um, you know, make sure that you research the company, make sure you research the role. Um, when you're going in and applying for a certain role, make sure that you understand what the expectations of the, the company and the job are. That's one of the most common feedback uh, that I hear is, uh, you know, people are applying with a certain um, idea in mind and it doesn't match what, um, you know, the company actually expects. Uh, so align yourself to that, uh, align yourself to understanding what the actual job is, uh, what the expectations are. A good way of doing this is if you know people in a similar role at a different company or the same company, you know, reach out to them, talk to them, get some advice on, you know, what your day to day looks like, what type of culture is at the company. You could do a lot of that research. So do your research online, research the company and the role, look at the requirements, make sure that your profile fits the requirements, and make sure that you are also a good fit for that company. Um, and if you can talk to people who worked there in the past or currently work there, that's going to help you a lot. Uh, in learning about the culture. Um, and then you want to make sure that, you know, punctuality, like if you've given a time, try to be, you know, five, 10 minutes early. Um, don't ever keep the interviewer or the recruiter waiting, right? They've taken time out of the busy schedule um, and you want to respect their time, just like you want them to respect your time. Um, you also want to, you know, make that good first impression. So that's very important. Dressing appropriately, um, this can vary depending on the company and the job. So again, when you research the company and role, do some research around what are some expectations, but just to be on the safe side, you know, you can't go wrong if you're business casual, right? Um, so if you're business casual, uh, you can, you know, pretty much if it's the expectations to be a little bit more formal, you fit in there. If it's to be a little bit casual, you're not overdressed. So be comfortable. You're going to be spending a whole day doing interviews. Um, do you know, have something that you feel confident in? If you're not feeling good or not feeling confident, it's going to show. It's going to show in your face. It's going to show in your body language. So make sure you dress appropriately. Um, hygiene is a big part of it. So just make sure that you know you're, you're taking care of you know your overall look and you're projecting the kind of look that you you know that that looks professional. But obviously, uh, <clears throat> in this uh, in our in our industry, the expectation isn't to you know you don't show up in a suit or tie or whatever. Um, at least in, in most cases, right? So, you know, no need to go there, but, you know, be clean, be neat, be on time. Um, do not um, talk over people, you know, do not um, like presume to know more. Even if you think you have more experience, you know more than the recruiter or the screener or the interviewer, you know, be polite and let them finish. Don't talk over them. Uh, give a good impression um, of someone who is going to come in and, you know, be a good team player. Uh, and, and this is the first place where you can start setting those expectations. Um, communicate clearly. Clear communication is just very, very important overall throughout your interview. Um, have good questions. So when you're doing the research about the company, have questions identified that you want to ask at, at each stage. What do you want to ask the uh, screen, um, the HR screener? What do you want to ask at the you know, phone screen in your actual uh, interviews? And, uh, you know, make sure that these are questions that are um, going to help you make a decision, right? So you don't want to ask questions around like salary, expectations or whatever to the, in the full loop, right? You, you want to ask them questions around, you know, what technologies do you work on? What are some of the biggest challenges you have? What uh, problems are you really trying to solve? Um, how do you think somebody with a background like mine can add to the team? Um, if you learn about the company, you can ask about specific projects. So you can ask about a new thing that they've released. So show them, Use the questions to also show them your passion for the company, for what they're doing. Uh, any sort of logistics questions, questions around, you know, commuting or salary or any of those, reserve those for the recruiter. Uh, you know, don't bring them to the to the interview. Once you've had your loop, you've had an offer, then it's a good time to talk about all of that compensation. And, you know, now that the job's in the bag, 
then it makes sense, right? To talk about those next steps, right? Uh, and negotiate them because at, at the point where you're even doing the interview, because you haven't got the job, you're not in a strong position of negotiating. So once you've had the offer, then you can also negotiate those things. So that's when it makes sense. Um, make sure that you're always explaining uh, what your what your thought process is, right? So there are times where you know if you if you get a whiteboarding question, coding question, you may just sort of be quiet and just you know scribble the answer. It's very important to make sure that you are talking through your answer because what's even more important than getting the right answer is the fact that you can show that you actually understand what you're saying, that you have good, clear, fundamental concepts. So that um, you know if they asked you a different question, like now that you've said, okay, you can show that I know how data structures work. They know that you can transfer that skill onto a different problem. So it's very, very important. And the second thing is that as an interviewer, you know, I'd want to see how you approach a problem, right? What is your, what is your thought process? How organized are you? Uh, how do you break stuff down? How structured are you? Um, so I think that's very, very important. Um, and this last one, be confident, but do not be arrogant. So uh, just in talking to people who've interviewed and talking to hiring managers, especially in Pakistan, one feedback that's come up a lot, which um, which is that candidates are either very nervous, like very underconfident, or they're overconfident at the point of being arrogant. So, you know, like, how do you strike that balance? I think it's, it's perfectly normal to be obviously nervous for an interview. I think everybody is, right? But... Um, you want to be able to have some some techniques that you can uh, feel your best, right? So you know, part of that might be you know waking up a little extra early. Um, for some people to get the energy up, maybe they want to exercise before, they want to dress a certain way, whatever it is that works for you. But make sure that you know you you do those things so that you feel more comfortable and you know you feel confident. It's okay to be nervous, um, but you know. Usually during the course of an interview, you should be able to get over that in the first 5, 10, 15 minutes and then really get into the flow. So, so try to find ways to exude that confidence, you know, sit up straighter, make better eye contact. If you have, if you've over-prepared, if you've done your research, if you have your questions, you know, then you are not kind of sitting blank. So all of that preparation really helps you feel that confidence, right? So be over-prepared and that is definitely going to help you with any sort of nerves that you have. Um, so on the, on the screening side, generally, um, I think this is at every step, but that first screening interview you have with HR, you want to be able to show that you're passionate about the company. You're there because you care about what they're doing. You've heard good things about them. So, um, I mean, you don't have to say it in so many words. You don't have to say, um, you know, I'm really passionate and enthusiastic about the company, but the, the way you're talking and how you're answering questions uh, sort of explains that. Um, Azim has a question, during the interview, should we learn to converse in English? Um, because many candidates get nervous and switch to Urdu explain. Um, I think it really depends on the culture, you know? So I think in Pakistan, it's okay to be switching between Urdu and English, or, or you know, like have a mix of English and Urdu. Um, so I think that's another thing when you're researching the company and you're doing your prep, that's what you need to ask is, is the expectation that I talk throughout in English? is the expectation that, you know, I can give the interview in Urdu. Um, and I think most companies are fine with a mix or, you know, if you want to give the interview in Urdu, you can just have that conversation up front, right? When you're talking to HR, when, you're, when they're screening, you can ask them that question um, and you can communicate, say, hey, I'm, I'm very comfortable just speaking in Urdu and explaining myself in Urdu. So uh, can that expectation be set so that they can communicate with the interviewer? Um, but I think a mix should be fine. And the look, it, your English doesn't have to be perfect, right? Um, it's it's easy to have one language for the interview because just like I was talking about having a standard hiring process, it's just a standard way of communication. So then both sides are not confused, right? Um, so don't focus too much on like your vocabulary or you know like your accent or whatever. That doesn't matter. You should be able to communicate clearly whatever you're trying to say. And if you're having a hard time, if you're someone who has a hard time communicating clearly, like if you cannot explain how your code or you cannot talk about a past project, uh, you know, uh, without uh, talking in Urdu, then you definitely should make that clear upfront and be uh, doing that interview in Urdu. Um, so demonstrating a passion for technology, again, this is, you know, a lot of it shows up in your body language, your excitement around when you're talking about past projects, when you're talking about companies, right? If you're kind of flat-toned and 
you know, you don't really um, show that enthusiasm, you know, the, the other side is not going to get that. You're really, really excited about it. So obviously don't be, don't overdo it, but just uh, try to keep a good medium. Um, consistent and clear communication skills. This is like the key. It doesn't matter what language you're speaking. It doesn't matter, um, you know, uh, if you feel like your your actual pronunciation accent or your, you know, the language you're using is broken. Uh, that's different from communication. Clear communication doesn't mean you speak a language well. I can speak some language really well, but the content of what I'm saying is rubbish, like it doesn't make any sense, or, you know, I'm speaking without real knowledge. And you can tell that difference, right? So it's really about making sure that you are clear. If you are nervous, speak slower, don't speak too fast, and, you know, try to be logically um, explaining yourself. So just be consistent and be clear. Um, don't try to treat every company with like with the same brush. So do your homework about the company, about the job and tailor your answers to the question, right? So if, for example, if a question is, um, you know, around, let's say they ask you about data and the company is, um, let's say a driverless car company, right? And, you know, you want to give some example about, oh, we're getting a lot of the, a lot of our data is coming through this electronic logging device that's uh, plugged into the, the engine. And this is how I'm getting these metrics. and. I'm going to get uh, data around the speed and I'm going to get data around the location. And uh, then I'm going to, you know, process this in this way. So try to even give your answers in that way. Um, and then just making sure that you understand the core company values and you're able to demonstrate them. So for example, uh, a company value might be, and some companies write it on their website or it's there or others, you, when you research and you talk to people, the person will tell you, oh, if you want to, in this company, they value, you know, disagree and commit. So disagree and commit means, you know, there's a group of you working on a project and you all cannot come to a conclusion about, you know, how to solve the problem or maybe what language to use or some other thing. Then you, you know, the majority will say, okay, you know what? Uh, or, or, you know, the decision maker could say, look, let's disagree on this, but commit to doing this my way, right? So let, even though a few of us disagree that, we should use, let's say, um, Go, Golang, the language for building the service. Let's disagree, but commit still. Let's uh, let's figure out, let's make sure that we're doing this project using this language. And then we can have a post-mortem after the fact and see whether this was a good or bad decision and what we could have done differently. So now, if that's a core value for a company, you should make sure that you understand that. And you should make sure that you are someone who is able to let go your personal feelings or let go your personal thoughts around something, if if a group of people decide like this is a better way, that you are someone who can disagree and commit to a problem, right? If, if you're not that sort of person, then you're not a good fit for them. And conversely, you will not be very successful at that company, right? So being able to look at the culture, understand the culture, um, and understand that, you know, the core values of the company kind of align with your core values. And when they do, you're also able to really show that you are a good fit. Um, how do we deal with technical questions you don't have answers to? Um, so I have that, um, the one answer here, I kind of go through it, but uh, if you're really stuck, right? Um, you they ask you a technical question and you really just don't know what to do. Uh, the first very important thing is, you know, keep calm. Don't uh, get flustered. Obviously it's, it's easier said than done, but try to, uh, one very good technique is repeat back the questions and say, oh, you know, did you ask this, this, this? And then say, okay, so let's try and clarify the question. So then, you know, if you have a whiteboard, use one one side of it and say, okay, so from this question, I understood you want me to do X, Y, Z. Um, ask them, you know, if you, if you came up with some assumptions because of the question, ask them um, like, okay, uh, so is it okay to return uh, a Boolean here or do you just want this to be a void and then you want me to print out my answer or something, right? And uh, just keep talking, right? Keep thinking through it, keep staying calm, keep trying to break the bigger problem into a smaller problem. Um, and, you know, most of the time the interview is there, if you're doing well, they want you to succeed, they'll, you know, they might give you hints there as well. So um, make sure that you are um, listening for hints and then you can solve that problem. So, uh, and then, you know, just keep going as far as you can. And then if you're really stumped, just sort of say, look, I'm not sure exactly how to solve this particular question, um, but, 
I do think, but but here's how I would approach it, and here's how I would generally think about it. And you know, if you're able to even get to like pseudo code or just explaining it, that's good enough. The main thing is sort of, you know, you don't want the interviewer to think that if you get uh, if you're given a really hard problem that you just give up, right? So you want to be able to demonstrate that you are able to think through stuff and you are able to, um, you know, speak intelligently about it. And that okay, if you really are stuck, then you know maybe. You're at some point. We say, you know, at this point, I, I don't have any other ideas. I don't have a clear way to solve this. But I'm, you know, my expectations have been a team. So at this point, I'd probably go to my lead or go to another person, and we'd have this conversation. But keep trying to work through it, and at least you'll show them that you know you don't give up and you keep thinking of ideas. And 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 who knows, as you're kind of breaking down the problem, you may actually come to solve it or solve a sub part of it, right? Uh, and that tells them that okay, if this person is given enough time. Uh, and given some maybe resources, they could have solved this problem on their own. Um, so tips for on-site interviews. Um, let's see, there's a couple more questions. How how in depth should we do homework about the company? Um, and uh, so yeah, it should be pretty in depth. Yeah, you know, when you're you're taking time to go interview the company, you better be sure that you are you know about them and you want to work there. And I think, you know, any company wants to see that you are excited to be there, that, you know, stuff that's public knowledge that you've made the effort to do your research on it. And it doesn't mean that you need to know all the details, but you need to know, like, for example, if you are interviewing at, um, let's say Microsoft, right? You want to make sure that, okay, you understand what some of the latest releases were, not you know not in even that specific group but overall like what is kind of microsoft working on if there was something that was released that you're excited about you can, you can say i was really excited to see you know xbox studios uh, bought this other game studio or they released this game or you know there's this feature in like excel that i've been wanting forever and it's so good to see that you know office has released that um you know so you should be the more research you do the more intelligently you can talk about and show your enthusiasm for the company um during an interview, if you don't know about anything, is it okay to say no rather than waiting? So my general opinion is uh, it's not, it's not, don't say no at the outset, right? Because like, let's say if I ask you a very black and white question, like, okay, do you know uh, C++? And if you don't know C++ and you haven't said that you know C++, it's totally fine to say, no, I don't know C++, but I'm familiar with object-oriented concepts and I know Java. And I'm pretty confident that if I had to learn it, uh, I can. I've taught myself new languages, and I have in the past learned new skills and languages for internships and projects, right? So that, you know, you, you're saying no about, you know, you're being truthful about what you don't know, but you're also, like, not using that time to um, not demonstrate that, oh, but I could learn that. Um, if it's like you're getting stumped in a question, you don't know the answer, uh, it's generally not not a good idea to say no. You know, you want to kind of work through whatever sub problem that you can. You want to make sure that you ask clarifying questions and you work through at least part of it. And then if you really don't get it, you know, um, you know, at least work till the end of your time, right? Um, and then you can sort of be really stumped, say, you know, I think that's about as far as I can go. And maybe if they have more time and they they like to approach, they might give you another question then and say, oh, okay, how about you try and solve this one? Because they might say, okay, maybe she's, or he's a little bit junior. Um, so maybe this question would be a little bit more advanced for them, but you know they might ask you a question that then you may be able to answer. So uh, if you say no and just kind of sit there, it gives me no data, right? And an interview is there to give the interviewer enough data to decide whether you'd make a good hire or not. So simple yes or no just doesn't give me any data. And when I don't have data, I'll err on the side of saying no hire because I'd rather not make a bad decision if I don't know, right? Rather than um, take a chance on someone for really no reason at all. So here's just some general tips on uh, oops, uh, on-site interviews. Again, always ask clarifying questions, whatever problem you're given. Uh, repeat it back, uh, clarify assumptions. So if somebody says, you know, um, reverse the linked list is the question. Then make sure that you ask, for example, okay, did you want me to do it in memory? Uh, did you want me to use another, you know, create another linked list? Do you want me to uh, you know, whatever it is, right? So make sure that whatever that question is, you're clarifying, you're clarifying the, you know, what the input is, what the output should be, you're clarifying your understanding of what they want returned. Always talk through your solutions. So um, if you are, 
going to be, let's say, have a problem around um, like some sort of sorting question, right? So as you're talking through it, you can say, oh, I can copy over, you know, I'm trying to sort this array. Now I'm going to copy it over to another array or, you know, I could leave it as is and I can just sort it in place. And if I sort it in place, this is why it would be better. I'm not using additional memory. Um, but if I copy it over, it's not going to take that much more memory and that way I can um, you know, keep the integrity of the original data set if I needed it for something. So, you know, as you're explaining that way, you can, as you're switching between it, you're explaining why you're doing it, right? So the more you're talking through your solutions, the more data you're giving me, the interviewer, to make a decision about you one way or the other, right? Um, and this also showcases your problem solving and analytical thinking. So it tells me, how do you think through problems? And to, to an interviewer, that's more important than to getting the right answer at the end. That, Okay, so when this person sees a problem, they first, they don't just jump into it. They don't jump into the code. They are, you know, they are clarifying requirements. So if this was a real problem and a real customer, they wouldn't just go and jump and do this. They would make sure that they um, make sure, made sure that they knew what the customer was asking. They would write down any assumptions that they were making. And then always sort of um, go through your problem uh, with, with the actual examples as well. Um, so, uh, show, showing your understanding of the bigger picture is also a very good idea. So, for example, if you're interviewing for a, a data science role, and um, you know, um, let's say it's like an e-commerce company, and uh, you know, you you ask some problem, you know, how would you build a model to uh, find out uh, when um, you know something gets delivered in uh, a certain amount of time? You know, so it's a, it's like a time estimation problem. So as you're going through that. You can also, like when you're talking to it, say, you know, something like this would be very important for an e-commerce company because you could use that data to do a lot of interesting things on search, for example. You might be able to show stuff that's going to get delivered um, in less time and uh, more at the top of search results. So more people will be shopping through it because more people would want faster delivery. Um, and, you know, I can build models that took into account the cost and the time. And, you know, that trade-off between that is something that we can use for search as well. So that they understand that okay, you're even though you're solving this problem that uses data and machine learning, it's actually applicable in the context of the marketplace and the context of e-commerce, and you're able to make the connection between the work that you do and how it ties into the goals of the company. So being whatever you can do to show your understanding of the bigger picture is very very useful because there are very few people who really can do that, and that really can set you apart. Um, if you're getting feedback during the interview, um, don't get defensive. Even if you get feedback after the interview, don't get defensive. Um, and if you can actually incorporate it, like if you're getting feedback about a coding question you're doing, if you can actually incorporate whatever feedback you're getting real time and use it in your um, answer, that's really going to show them that you're somebody who can just learn on the fly, take feedback real time and apply it, and you're going to be a good growth employee. So for example, Let's say you wrote code and there was some bug in it and you weren't able to identify. Um, and so your interviewer said, oh, you know, I don't think that's going to work for this particular input because I think that it's missing something. And, you know, instead of saying, no, I've checked it and I think my code is fine and it should work, you should say, oh, okay, let me take a look. And you actually can, you know, slowly run it through the, uh, the code again. And then, you know, if you actually spot the problem, like, oh, actually, you're right, I'm not checking you know, uh, length. And so this is going to be an index out of array and I should be checking that here and I should be returning false if, you know, it falls out of the bounds. So if you're able to actually do that, take that feedback, do that real time, that really is um, a very good way of showing that you'd be a good team fit. Um, talked about what you do when you're stuck. Um, and I think this last part is, is pretty important because in a lot of interview situations, interviewees feel like, you know, they're being judged and they're going to be, um, you know, the interviewer's goal is to make them fail. You know, that's usually not the case, you know. I mean, somebody may have a, a different experience, you know, in, in some one-off cases, but in general, you know, the interviewer has taken their time to come and interview you because they think you're a good fit. They want people in their company. And they want you to succeed. So if you're doing well, you're a general good fit. They want to make sure that, um, that you're doing well. Um, and so they will try to help you with, with hints, uh, especially if you have a good attitude about stuff, you know, they're like, okay, this is person is a learner, even if they couldn't solve this, you know, look at how well they approach this and they have such a good attitude about it. So treat the interviewer as your partner. And I think that's when you'll have the most productive uh, interview. Um, 
Behavioral interview components. So this part, I mean, is very important. Um, I just kind of wrote down uh, a bunch of different, um, you know, types of behavioral questions or, or things that behavioral questions are testing. So they're testing your teamwork, your ability to work with others. Um, if you run into a problem, you know, how do you resolve it with a team? Or if you have a conflict with another person, how do you resolve it? How do you mediate through it? They want to, me to measure your emotional intelligence. So how good is your EQ? Do you stay calm under pressure? Um, how mature are you at dealing with, you know, people, very diverse set of people at work? Um, are you able to learn new things on the fly? How willing are you to be able to continuously learn? Are you somebody who's going to be dependable? Are you going to show up on time? Are you going to do something when you say you're going to do it? Uh, if you give a deadline, do, are you going to meet it? You know, are you reliable? Um, and then how well do you fit with the team? How, fell, how well do you fit with their culture, right? Um, so these are the, the things when they're asking you questions around, um, you know, I'll, I'll go into the next one. You know, if they're saying, tell me about yourself, these are the types of things that they're trying to figure out from it. So. Um, you know, tell me about yourself shouldn't be what they already see in the resume. It shouldn't be like a list of like, okay, here's, I, I went here, I did this degree, I got this GPA. They already know that, right? They want to know, you know, okay, what's your kind of brief version of your um, career or your academic uh, history? And then they also want to know, like, you know, I'm, um, you know, so for example, if I'm, if somebody asks me that question, I'll say, you know, I, um, I have a, like, like I introduced myself, I have a background in computer science. I've worked on all kinds of products from developer tools to search to e-commerce to gaming. Um, my passion is just technology. I've worked on online services, distributed systems, shrink wrap products. Um, and you know what excited me about um, technology is that I can apply my general uh, skills to solve a very broad set of problems. Um, um, I also really like you know reading uh, nonfiction because I like to uh, improve my myself. Uh, my favorite uh, things to work on outside of you know work hours or or this or that. So it's it's good to throw in a little bit of personal, but something that's still related to the job or the type of interview you're doing. Uh, but you know don't go into um, a lot of details or tangents on you know volunteer work you've done or things you're interested in is not related to the job. So if you want to highlight a few things about yourself that relate to the job, that makes sense. But you know don't it's not like a whole biography on you. Uh, strengths and weaknesses is another one. And again, that question, you know, they're, they're trying to see your EQ, your willingness to learn new skills, how do you resolve conflict, your culture and team fit. These are the kind of things they're trying to evaluate. So, um, you know, I mean, a lot of people will say on weaknesses, they'll say, you know, my, my biggest weakness is that, you know, um, I care too much or my biggest weakness is, you know, they'll try to say something that's more like a positive thing, but call it a weakness. Um, I think the probably the most neutral way to answer this type of question is to say is to come up with something that isn't super hundred percent relevant or important to your job, but that's something that you feel is an area for improvement and you genuinely want to improve it. So, for example, if you're uh, interviewing for a backend dev job, then you may want to um, say, you know. Um, I'm always, I've always been nervous at public speaking. Um, it is something that I, you know, I feel like uh, I want to do more of, but uh, it's a weakness in terms of, I, I don't feel comfortable, you know, talking in front of a large audience. Um, and so, um, you know, so you've explained that, but then also follow it up with, but you know, I've enrolled myself in a, in a class that will help me with my, you know, public speaking skills. I'm reading this book that I think will help me with this. And in general, I'm, shadowing people who are, who are good at it so I can learn from them. Um, and I'm taking small baby steps, like I'm starting to present to you know my larger team, maybe instead of the, my core team of 10, I'm gonna present to like these you know 100 people and just give a brown bag, like a, start with an informal brown bag on you know how to learn a new language or something, right? So you want to talk about a weakness, but you also want to show how you're going to work on it. Um, but if you're going in for a back-end coding interview, and you say, you know, my biggest weakness is that, you know, um, I just don't understand how object-oriented languages work. You know, that's not going to be good because that's a core competency for that job. And that's not a weakness. That's saying that you lack the complete skills for that job. So, so you know, these are common questions that you can think through beforehand. You can prep, you can have answers to. So don't leave these to think on the spot, right? Um, 
I see a few questions. Chat. Um, so if the person taking the interview asks about a particular topic, uh, which falls under the NDA with your current company, how to go about it, how to handle the situation? A good question. Um, so if they ask about a particular topic, you can just always talk in generics, right? So if they're saying, uh, you know, you worked on this project, explain exactly your role and what you did. Um, and let's say the project, you know, you don't have to take the names of the specific product or the company, but you can talk in gen generics uh, for sure, right? So if you say like, okay, yes, I was, uh, like I, I, I can give an example from gaming, right? So if I'm working on a game at EA that hasn't been released yet, that, the, you know, the press doesn't know, that we're not going to announce until later. And if I get asked a question about it, uh, I'm not going to mention the studio. I'm not going to mention the game. I'm not going to mention anything which will give away what is releasing. But I'll say, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, I've, uh, I've generally worked on a first-person shooter. And uh, what I worked on there is leaderboards and um, the matchmaking service for that game. And how the matchmaking service works is, you know, it matches you according to your skill level with everybody else who's online. And then your leaderboards are also in your tier. So, you know, if you are matched with the people ranking in a certain skill level, your leaderboard will also just be for that cohort. And, you know, and then you can go into more detail about, okay, and this is how I designed the leaderboard, or this is how I designed the matchmaking service. So you're not giving anything away. If you feel like saying first person shooter will give it away, don't even say that. Just says, I'm working on a, I was working on a game back end. And I, you know, because of NDA, I can't go into more details, but I was working on the piece that helped you match make and, uh, and uh, do stats or whatever, right? So you can still talk about the problem you solved without giving away any of the, the details. Uh, <clears throat> um, so where do you see yourself in X years? Um, I think this is an important one. I made a note here, uh, especially in the Pakistani company context. Uh, one recommendation that I would say is don't, you know, if you have, plans for your own startup or you want to do your master's or you know if there's any future plans that you have that basically mean that you'll be uh, leaving the company um, then you want to make sure that you're not giving you, you don't have to give that right this is not uh, you're not talking to like a friend here you're still going in for an interview so I'm not asking you to be untruthful but you uh, want to be more generic right and you want to talk about where do you see yourself in x years in terms of you know, um, that company that you're going at, right? Assume that, you know, oh, I'm going to get this job and they want to hear me talk about what I would be, how I could be contributing, you know, in the next five years. So say, you know, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a mid-level uh, backend developer. The next five years, uh, I want to continue growing my backend skills, but I also want to develop my full stack skills. So, um, you know, I, I'm able to work end-to-end -end on projects um, that I can work on front end as well and gives me that experience. I also want to build up my, you know, my data science skills so that I can actually look at problems involving modeling and kind of grow myself there. Um, I also love helping others. I love being a mentor. I love uh, looking at the big picture strategically. So I would want to grow in the leadership path versus an individual contributor path, right? So giving a generic answer like that, where you're talking about more like, uh, Making it clear that you know if you want to stay like an individual contributor, that's a good thing to say and say because I'm I'm very passionate about just going deep into a problem and really learning my domain, and so I want to you know contribute as an individual, or I you know I like working and growing others, and so I think I can be a good leader. Giving that type of answer makes a lot more sense because then they can also see like okay this person would fit in really well with this team because we think that we have more junior people. So this person comes in and maybe a year or two, we can grow them into a leader. You know, that's how they're looking at it. If you're talking about, you know, um, at three years, I want to do my own startup. I think that's great if you do, but you know, that timeline is not guaranteed either. And if you're saying that you're telling your potential employer that we probably, if you're going to hire them, they're going to stick around for maybe three years. So, you know, they might decide to go with someone else who, um, they think will stick around longer, right? So that's definitely where you see yourself in X years is is one of those questions where you should be a bit more vague and just, you know, go back to um, here, right? So uh, culture and team fit, um, willingness to learn new skills. Those are the kind of things you want to demonstrate. Uh, tell me about a time when. Um, so these type of questions, um, and the, the format here is I'm just trying to give you 
you know, the kind of general behavioral questions that you can get that you can prepare beforehand. So you don't wait for the day of the interview to come up with a good answer. Write your talking points. If you get nervous talking, you know, somebody said about, you know, in, uh, you know, using a particular language, this is a great way to rehearse, right? Write your script down, stand in front of a mirror, rehearse it so you get more confident. The more you pre-prep certain things, the more you'll feel even more confident the day of. So these are the type of questions you should have had some thinking already. Don't wait for the day because when you're already nervous, you're not going to come up with the best way of showcasing your skills, right? So tell me about a time when uh, is one way for them to, uh, you know, depending on how they pose a question, one way for them to figure out, you know, one of these areas. So uh, one thing they may want to do is, okay, how does this person work as a team, right? Teamwork. So tell me about a time when you, um, you know, you disagreed with the, with your manager on how to solve uh, or how to approach a particular problem and how did you go resolve that? Or tell me about a time when you had to do something very difficult at work. What was it and why? Um, or tell me about a time when, um, uh, you know, you, uh, you and the product team, um, you, you know, weren't agreeing and how did you resolve it? So that you may get a lot of like teamwork and conflict resolution type questions. And the way you want to answer those is you want to, uh, you know, explain how you would solve it, but always give an example. So, you know, so for example, if I say, well, tell me about a time when you disagreed with your manager and say, well, um, it was about, you know, my, the, my, the job um, before last where uh, we were, supposed to uh, work on this big data problem. And my manager really wanted us to use Hadoop for that particular um, problem. And, um, you know, I thought that, you know, because a lot of the data we're getting was very real time and we wanted to do analysis on it in more real time that, uh, you know, uh, using some sort of a queuing mechanism, like, uh, you know, using Spark or, uh, you know, having a Kubernetes cl cluster where I can do more processing real time would be more useful, right? So I'm just making it up. And uh, and then you say, um, so I, what I decided to, is to go back and do a little bit more research on why I think um, my solution makes more sense for the team in the long run. And I went back, um, you know, I had set up a one-on-one -on -one with an agenda with my manager and tried to walk him through or her through why I think the solution makes sense. Because you know both solutions will work, but the one, the one that I think makes more sense uh, is because it will uh, continue to work for longer, and we're able to process stuff much more quicker. Versus the Hadoop uh, will require you know as we get more data, the jobs will take longer, and so if we are if this solution is supposed to alert you when something is um, you know down on the life side, there's going to be at least a 15 to 20 minute delay between when the incident occurred. And when we caught it versus if we use uh, Spark, then we are going to find it, you know, within minutes. And that's very important, the longer run for a customer. Um, uh, so, you know, so that's the kind of thing that you want to say, okay, how do you resolve a conflict? Um, and then you can talk about, well, you know, my manager agreed that what I said was making sense, but because of the timing of it, what we decided is we'll use Hadoop for now. And then, uh, then we'll have a kind of, part of the team for V2 working on converting that to Spark and uh, the other team working on something else. Uh, and, you know, we agreed that that makes sense. So just always give an example, have an example from your past. If you can't think of a good example, make one up, right? Because you're prepping for this. Think of a situation that could have happened and how you would have reacted to it. But realize that these questions are being asked because those are the things that they're trying to ascertain. Um, and give an example when you where you showed. So this is again this type of question is going to show you know your leadership abilities, uh, your you know how dependable you are, your team fit. So tell me about a time when you know you faced a particularly hard problem at work. Uh, what did you do? Um, and so again, it's good to come up with an example and say um, I was uh, you know asked to come up with a model to determine if something was going to be, you know, let's say I'm working at eBay and I have to determine if something is going to be delivered um, the next day. And a lot of the data that I had to do the model was not giving me um, the handling time that the seller would take. I only had the time that the postal service would take. So it was very hard for me to come up with a, a high accuracy or high precision model. Um, and then, um, you know, I went and I talked to a few people on the team 
on how do I get you know better data, how do I clean that data up, whatever that is, right? So it it shows them that you one way that you approach problem solving when you're stuck is you go to the team. So you're a team player, you try to utilize other people's knowledge, um, you try and learn something new, uh, you don't give up, you keep trying to solve that problem. So just have make sure that you know these are the things in the back of your mind that you're trying to demonstrate that you are a team player, that you know how to resolve conflicts, that you don't just shut down when you have a disagreement. You're able to logically um, explain to the other person your point of view. And if they don't get it, or even if they get it, but you know, you, you're still willing to compromise on that particular solution for the good of the team or to make sure that everybody's you know, disagreeing and committing. EQ, willingness to learn, dependability, team fit. These are the, the, the kind of things that they're trying to ascertain when they ask you these type of questions. So prepare as much as you can. Um, so uh, maybe I'll take a few questions now before I get into next slides. <clears throat> if they're offering an unpaid internship, should we ask them to pay a stipend and interview? Um, so if you're interviewing for an unpaid internship, I would say first go through the loop, interview, get the offer. And um, you know the, the discussion about stipend or whatever should be done at the beginning with, with your HR or recruiter, not with the, because usually the people who are interviewing you have nothing to do with your pay or they're not the ones who are deciding like what your level should be, what level they're bringing you up on, right? That's usually outside of their remit. So have that conference, uh, you know, that conversation upfront with the recruiter. If they're telling you, oh, this is an unpaid internship, then you know, ask them, okay, will you be paying for my, you know, bus fare, or will you be paying for gas? Will you be paying for food? Whatever those things are, um, and you know, and then you make that decision. So know that beforehand. I mean, they they should be able to tell you all of that beforehand, but don't ask about it in the interview. The interview should be very focused on your skills and showcasing that you're very excited about the job. You're there because you want to learn and grow. Um, if you talk about compensation or salary and that stuff, you know, it sort of muddies the water in that, you know, if you come across as, you know, too greedy or, you know, something you say, it's, it's a higher chance for you to piss someone off because you asked something that they weren't expecting or, you know, that they, they can have some preconceived notion about you and you don't want to bias the interviewer, right? Plus, interviewer usually does not know. So like, even if when I'm interviewing, uh, you know, I know what the budget is for the role. I know that, you know, what range I want to give this person. But, uh, you know, that all is done after the interview because a lot of that depends on how well the person did in the interview, right? So if you did, like, a, you know, if you talked up front and they said, no, nope, sorry, no stipend, We're, it's unpaid, you pay for food, gas, we, we, don't, we, only, we don't pay you anything. And you go through the interview process and you do so well, maybe after the fact when they offer it to you, um, then you can say, you know, I'm sorry, without a stipend, I'm unable to do this. And then they might say, oh, okay, we'll, you know, we really liked you. We thought you were a good fit. And, you know, we're willing to pay you a stipend because we don't think that we want to interview further because you're such a good candidate or something. But yeah, keep it out of the um, general loop. Um, all right. So technical interview, uh, you know, be prepared to write code. If you haven't um, done coding for a while, Give yourself that time before going to interviews to prep. Um, use lead code. There's just a lot of resources. There's a whole handbook um, that I already shared, um, and we can share again. Uh, just links and resources. There's so many resources out there. YouTube has a bunch of videos on you know people doing mock whiteboarding interviews. Take a look. Those are very very realistic uh, ways of how you know you can think of uh, where most technical interviews run. Um, if you're asked, you know, a coding question, you know, you definitely want to make sure that you're again clarifying. You listen carefully to the question. You repeat it back. You write down inputs, outputs, um, and then before you um, write code, uh, it's it's a very good idea to you know, as you say, okay, this is the question that I understood. Here's how I think I'll solve it. And as you're talking through so that, you may even want to write some pseudo code or you know, just in English, say. First, I will check this. If the input is this, I'll do this. And then run it through an example. So say, so for example, um, if you want me to, you know, if you're given input uh, are these two strings and you want me to return whether they're anagrams, then first I will, you know, um, you know see the length, see if they're the same length. If they're not, then I'll return false. Um, 
if they are the same length, then I will go through and, you know, I'll check X, Y, Z. So we're talking through, you've said your, you know, my input can be, um, you know, Anna and, you know, and then Nana, right? That's your, those are your two strings. And then you're checking for anagrams. And then you say, okay, this is what I'll check and I'll return this, right? So you're making sure that even before you write any code, you've um, asked the interviewer, like, this is what you're expecting. This is the return. And if uh, if I gave this black box as input, this is the output I would get. So that's very useful for you to get started in making sure that you've understood all the, the constraints. Um, so, you know, write your pseudocode, work through an example. Um, and then as you actually start writing code, um, you know, write very clearly, use good naming conventions. So if the question is, you know, are the given two strings, are they anagrams or not, return true. Um, and say, okay, uh, my um, function will return a Boolean. Pick a language that you're most comfortable in, right? So if it's, let's say, C++ or Java, um, you know, return the right syntax, right? So if it's bool, write bool. If it's Boolean, write Boolean. Um, and then uh the the fun the function should be something very um specific like you know is anagram and then you get the two strings right so the the naming conventions should be very clear um if you're doing um some checking in the in the main code for you know whether anagram or not and there's a lot of uh string conversion so maybe you want to write a separate helper function that does <coughs> excuse me that does the conversion so maybe you want to um, maybe one of the uh, um, things about the input is, is that it can be lowercase or uppercase, right? So you want to have maybe a helper function that converts all inputs to lowercase. So then you're always checking lowercase against lowercase. So you want to write like a helper function. You want to call it modularly. Just small things that, that show that you um, you care about code maintainability. You care about support. You care about you know reuse. Um, and, so, and that 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 helps to show your um, attention to detail and you know that you don't just write code to solve the problem you're going to write code that you know is going to be uh, easy to maintain um, easy to follow through later on um, so write clear elegant code don't try fancy shortcuts uh, for the first run you know go through like the the brute force method and then you can go and um, you know as I write here you can review the solution then you can optimize um it's always good to uh once you're done so for a for a coding question um um i always feel like candidates who can really explain the solution well like even if they don't optimize it if they can say okay here's how i would just go you know um you know and check the first in index of this string with the first index of this string go through uh, you explain that and then you say and but you know if i did this using a hash map here's how i would do it and even if you don't have time and you can't really write that code, explain why that's an optimization, and then be able to explain time and space complexity. That you know, in my previous solution, you're going through a for two for loops, so it's n square. This solution will be you know, order of n because now I'm not going through; I'm just iterating once. Um, so you should be able to explain that you know that's the the time complexity and why order n is better than n square. You should be able to explain memory as well, right? So uh, I'm going to do this in memory, so I'm not going to use additional, I'm not going to allocate uh, additional space for this. So this is why this is more optimized. It's very important to be able to know how to speak about time and space complexity. So do your revision of big O notation and space and time complexity. Um, again, if you're stumped by a problem, uh, take the bigger problem, try to break it down into subproblems, and see if you can solve just a subproblem, right? And that's one way. And then maybe if you're solving multiple subproblems, you then actually can solve the the entire problem itself. So do talk through a solution, use clear naming, modular code, check for bugs, edge cases. Um, even if you're running out of time or you don't have you know the time to run through all of the uh, edge cases, at least talk through them or like you know comment uh, your code and say you know to do. Uh, check for um, index uh, out of bounds to do, check for edge cases, check for length, return return if null. So at least you're showing that I would do these tests. Or if you're going through, once you've written the code, you're going through it with an example, say, I'd have time to write all of the edge cases, but here's all the, the, in, the things that I would test for, and here's the um, edge case checking I would do. Um, if you're actually 
talking through two different solutions, be able to, you know, wow them with uh, more explanation of why you picked one over the other or what, what are the trade-offs, right? So the more you can talk about that, the more you show them that I understand fundamentals and concepts, which is very important. Um, don't stay quiet through the process. Um, make sure that you're talking through so you can show them how your problem solving works, how your brain works. Um, don't interrupt your interviewer. Don't talk over them. I've had situations where, you know, uh, the interviewer will tell me that while they think the solution I'm trying to put them towards is a good one, they think that the way they're approaching it is better. And here's why. Um, sometimes that works out if you really are, have thought through something that I haven't. But most of the time that would backfire, right? Because even if you're the most brilliant person and you solved it better than anybody could have. The point is not to solve the question, right? The point is to show me that you would be a good fit with the team. You can work with others. Uh, if you come across as someone who just always wants to, you know, be a one man show or one woman show, you know, you're not going to work well in the team. So you're not going to be somebody that I'd want on my team, right? But maybe you're a great, um, you know, senior IC who works by himself somewhere doing some research stuff. So it's very important to you know, don't take the interview opportunity to just, you know, be me, me, me. Use it to show that, like, I, this is how I work well in a team. Um, you know, don't be rude to the interviewer. Don't tell them they're wrong. Sometimes, you know, your interviewer can be uh, maybe very um, adversarial. Like, maybe you're in a situation where you feel like the interviewer is not making you very comfortable. It's okay. Don't react. Um, if they're trying to push your buttons, don't be rude. Don't react. Sometimes, that's what they're testing for to see, you know, how do you react to these situations? And um, and you want to make sure that you keep your cool um, and that, you know, uh, you're not reacting in, in any, any way that you shouldn't. Um, so we're at the last kind of four or five minutes. Um, I will take that time for questions. Um, but, you know, I'm wishing you all a lot of luck. Uh, and really, it's really about, you know, practice. Do a lot of practice. Um, Multiple interviews, you know, if you don't make it, it's okay. They're just practice for your actual job. Um, this question is, what advice would you like to give fresh grads for interviews? Practice. If, you know, the, the biggest thing that fresh grads lack is they don't have a lot of experience. They've not done a lot of interviews. You might have an idea of what an interview experience is like, but you don't actually know till you've done, done it. So, um, you know, if you have a list of companies you're applying to, um, maybe, you know, just like with college, right? Um, uh, rank them. So say, okay, these ones are going to be kind of my backup. So don't interview it like your dream job as the first interview. Do some other interviews so you get kind of used to it. Every interview will give you, you know, if you treat it like a learning experience instead of like a binary pass or fail, then every interview you do will prepare you better for the next one. So see what um, gaps there were, you know, if, if there were certain things that you thought, Oh, I could have done better, you know, prepare for those for the next one. Um, if you're doing, you know, technical interviews, um, you have to be comfortable writing code on the whiteboard or on a virtual whiteboard. So use Collab Edit or Google Docs or any one of these kind of screen share things. Do mock interviews with your friends. Um, uh, you know, if there's a bunch of you prepping, prepping together, like just like, um, you know, uh, like you do college projects, prep together. Um, the way you're solving a problem, somebody else might give you a better perspective on how to solve it. And then kind of all of these uh, things that I talked about, right? Like making sure you're clear, communication, prepping all of that really helps. So the more you do that, the better. And lead code, I think, and a few of these others are very useful. Okay, long question. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I want to share my experience. Hired as a trainee developer. They called me to show my final year project after the interview the second day. Um, we have three months and unpaid, and they really show that they like me. Uh, I, the last part of the question is truncated. I was emailed that I'm shortlisted and I raised. Uh, I don't see the rest of the question. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so um, it looks like. Um, if somebody can read the rest and sort of uh, maybe write it here, but otherwise we could just answer it on the page. But uh, it looks like it's similar to sort of the, the stipend question you asked before. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, if, look, if the stipend is really important for you, if it's a deal breaker for you, that if you, un unless you get that stipend, you cannot take that job, 
then you need to have that conversation beforehand and then decide like even if i get the job if they're not going to pay that stipend then i'm going to say i'm sorry you know it doesn't work for me but if it's something that you can negotiate on or you can compromise on because you know you want that experience you want that on your resume you know you feel like okay you're getting that because you know it's it's really more about being able to uh, afford that travel versus like it's not going to make a material difference in your career whether you get paid for that internship or not right um so then you know you, you make that a criteria for your search that if that's an expectation then look for opportunities where they will be paying you the stipend or the whatever it is that you require right um if companies are saying that um or, or you know even if they change their mind later they they can have the prerogative but then you have the right to say okay no right because that tells you that okay you're also probably not going to be a good fit for them um if they said one thing before and said another thing after um um yeah so i think what they're uh you know if 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 they saw what you were saying coming across as okay this person might you know um you know if you hire them and they might bring this up again um and we don't want to have this conversation because we've had this conversation like it looked like they probably took that as this person you know we've we've explained to him he's not getting it and maybe if we hire them they might have other things that they bring up that um you know even though we've said we don't do that um that they they might you know bring that up and have an issue with it so because we're in an internship they're not committing to someone for the long haul right so this is a short term project so they have more options um yeah so i think i would just say that maybe it's good that that happened because you know it also showed you you know not just you wouldn't have maybe liked working there because you know they're not very collaborative or something like that but what i would say is you know probably go back and you know if you can talk to the recruiter talk to them and just say you know um i understand that you um are not considering me because you know i asked for a stipend and you um you know so that that's not something you do um uh, but can you give me some feedback how could i have handled this better or what would have been the right time to say it because my my goal was to get this internship i didn't want to come across uh in, in any wrong way um but it looks like i did so i'd love it if you give me feedback so just you know at least use that uh, this opportunity to get the feedback so you you know you do it differently in the next in the next one um so i think with that i'm uh, i'm out of time um thank you very much uh again i wish everybody a lot of luck uh we've just kicked off prep days your the jobs will be posted soon um the coming week we have another day of prep next uh, uh tomorrow please attend all the sessions they'll all be recorded as well uh this will be very useful for you to you know have a very productive uh, interview experience uh and just prepare nothing will uh take the place of hard work and preparation i uh, wish you all the best thank you